something you said to me which uh, really, I think, resonated was you said, uh, no one believes us. And uh, you became very emotional at that point. And, and uh, I'm wondering, why do you think that is? Why do you think, uh, as you say, no one believes you? I guess I should say there are people that believe us, but majority of the people do not believe us. I think a lot of it had to do with the media and how the media portrayed Jerry before he even went to trial. Um, and I, I don't know, I guess it's just because of everything that has come across that how we are and what he is. How would you describe what that has been like for you and your family? Um, I've heard you described as uh, strong-willed, tough as nails by some people. <laughs> um, and so I'm wondering, um, even with that tough exterior, uh, how that has taken a toll on you and your family. Um, I try to look at the positives, and I don't really try to look at the negatives or listen to what people say. I know who, who we are, and I know who I am, and I know who Jerry is. Um, I'm, it's probably maybe been harder on our children um, and the grandchildren. Um, I just, I guess I just really, like I said, I know who I am and what I am, and I know that I do not tell lies. Tell me why you believe your husband so much. You have never wavered in your belief in right. what he has told you. Right. Because that's the way Jerry has been for 30, I mean, I've known him for 38 years. I was, I've been married to him for 37, and he's always been truthful to me. And um, I've asked him, and we've talked about it, and I, the, the stories are just, I cannot believe the stories that have been told about him. Jason, it's important to point out that this is, because of the nature of this case, this is not a situation where Dottie is simply standing by her man and has no knowledge of the accusations. The testimony in this case, as you well know, since you were there at the trial, indicates that Dottie was essentially a witness, that she has to know that Jerry is guilty if, in fact, he is guilty based upon the testimony at trial. And it's important that people understand that Dottie in no way, shape, or form believes that Jerry is guilty, and that she has to be lying for him to be as guilty as he was convicted of being at trial. And that part of why I'm involved in this case is I am positive that Dottie knows that Jerry is innocent, and that that is an issue that needs to be dealt with. You can't believe the media narrative about Jerry Sandusky unless Dottie is lying, and no one can possibly convince me of that in a rational world. And I couldn't have done that on, you know, when I was testifying. I was under oath. And um, I couldn't, I wouldn't have told a lie. If I had believed Jerry was guilty, I would have said he was guilty, no matter what it would, have, who it would have hurt, or how it would have people, you know, what would have happened. Because I mean, that is a court, and you are not to lie. Mm -hmm. How how has this affected your family? It's been tough on our our family. Um, they've stuck together. They've, um, you know, we're a close family. Um, the kids talk to each other. Uh, two of our kids have lost their jobs during this time, whether it's because of this or just it happened to be at that situation. Um, our grandkids, um, some, of them, some of them are old, old enough to understand what has gone on, and they know who their pop is and what he, what he, I mean, what people are saying he is, but they know who he is and what he is. Um, and it's just, it's been really, it's been hard on them and for people to, They've been really lucky, and the people that majority of them have been in the same places that they had been. So the people knew them before this happened, and they knew who they were and what they were. Now some have moved, and um, they are still, you know, they still have friends, and people are supportive of them. I, I think you told me a story once that uh, when I'd asked about what it's like living here in the community, because you're still in the same home, still in the same neighborhood. And I think you had told me um, a woman had come up to you, I can't remember where it was, and she came very close to your face and she looked at you and said, I just wanted to make sure it was you. It was something like well, that. Well, she, it was at the airport mm -hmm. and here in State College, and she came right up to my face, I mean, like this close, and she goes, hmm, hmm, I thought so. And she walked away. And I just, I was with our daughter, and I go, ooh, okay. <laughs> you know, I just um, let them, you know, let people say what they want to say. Um, no one... I go out to eat, I go to, I go to work out, I go to the grocery store, I go to church. Um, and people, if they say things, no one other than there was a local reporter who was very aggressive right after the trial. 
And I, I afterwards, I think I, I wouldn't have done it because I don't like to tell, I don't like to lie. Um, he asked me if I was Dottie Sandusky, and afterwards I thought, well, maybe I should have just said, no, I don't think so, or something, and walked away. But he was very pursuant. Mm -hmm. Jason, it's important from the consciousness of guilt or lack thereof perspective, I think, to understand that Dottie never even thought about moving from state college. Now, if, if somehow she, in any way, shape, or form, felt guilt, shame, or felt that Jerry was guilty, why would you stay here? And, and by the way, her life would probably be far easier if she had thrown Jerry under the bus, because people here wanted her to do that. They be, so she has stood up for what she believes to be the truth against her own self-interest here. Mm -hmm. and I just want to follow up with that, because I'm wondering, you know, there must be days and challenges for you living here, living in the same neighborhood, facing the same neighbors who believe that your husband is guilty. Um, from what I get from the neighbors, there's only a few that believe that way. My other neighbors are very supportive. If they think Jerry's guilty, they don't show it toward me. Mm -hmm. um, they, you know, they're very nice to me. I mean, like we've been, we've lived here almost 30 years. It'll be 30 years in August since we moved in the house. But there are a few, uh, there's a few neighbors that are not very nice, but that's okay. I mean, I know who I am and what I am. How, how do you manage to deal with those neighbors who are that way? I smile at them. I wave at them. I just go my merry way, and at some day, I hopefully I will be able to talk to them. Yeah. You know, when you l look back at the case, both of you, um, and I'm going to open this up to both of you, um, and ask you both the same question. When you look back at the case, and you listen to what the attorneys say who represented these young men who came forward, um, they will tell you that uh, the amount of evidence was overwhelming. And so what I say to you is, given the evidence that's out there, which some say is was overwhelming, now you have some 26 uh, young men who Penn State has paid, these young men all saying that they were in some, some way abused by Jerry Sandusky. In the face of all of that, um, why do you still believe? Because I, I, he is innocent. Um, some of those, most of, like even like accuser number 10, Jerry and I do not even remember or don't even know who he is. Um, and it, you were at trial, so you know. Two policemen lied on the stand, and the, and the judge did nothing about that. Um, victim number one and victim number nine, they said that they were at our house at the same time for three or four years, but only ever saw each other one time. We, had, we have six kids. We had 11 grandchildren at that time. And Jerry was still doing things with the second mile, like speaking and traveling. There is no way that they could have been here the length of time that they said. And at least they could have not been here and not have met each other more than one time. Do you ever uh, um, look back at that and, and say to yourself, how then could this have happened in terms of a conviction? I think a lot of it was the media. I think Jerry was found guilty before he ever went to trial um, because once he was arrested and then it all fell down that, you know, Joe was fired, um, Graham Spaniard was fired, the other administrators were, were put on a leave. Um, I think everybody just thought, and Penn State said, there's money, we are going to, you know, we are going to give money to the accusers. And I don't know whether... Um, I mean, I don't, I don't know if Penn State met with some of them. There was one that, this hasn't been brought out, but they accused Jerry. They said that Jerry took him in, his, in Jerry's office, gave him liquor, and got him drunk. We do not drink. And as our kids said, Jerry would not even know where to go to buy, to buy alcohol. So, I mean, some of the stories were just out, outlandish. The key moment in this whole case for people to understand, because I get the people think that this is an insane concept who haven't followed the case, but you need to understand how this case evolved. There was a three-year grand jury investigation, mm -hmm. three years, at the end of which there were six accusers, mm -hmm. only two of whom claimed sex. Both of them have huge credibility issues, but it was the firing of Joe Paterno, the unjust firing of Joe Paterno in my view, which is what got me into this case, 
That's why I run a website, FramingPaterno.com. I believe, figuratively, not literally, that Joe Paterno was framed in all this. But it was the firing of Joe Paterno that causes a symbiotic relationship between the, the railroading of Jerry Sandusky and the railroading of Joe Paterno. When Joe Paterno is fired, it is a nuclear explosion that goes through the landscape that. of this case. And because of that, Jerry Sandusky loses all presumption of innocence. All of his supporters run for the hills. People who should be his greatest supporters are now his greatest detractors. They hate him. And so now, all of a sudden, in a case where there is only testimony, there is no hard evidence, there's no physical evidence, it's all testimony, it's all perception. Once you lose that presumption of innocence in a case like this, now the snowball goes down the hill, it becomes an avalanche, the media jumps on board, and no one checks the original math of the story. The original math, and I got it wrong too, the original math of this story is wrong, and that's why everything else about this case is wrong. You know, I think people can go back and forth, and they can they, you can, they can argue your point, you can argue another point. But one thing that um, what I try to get to is, uh, you know, your relationship with Jerry. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, I'm, I want to backtrack even, let's just go back even a, a little further. Um, at what point was there a discussion between the two of you? Uh, when, and I'm just wondering how it went when Jerry came to you and said, Dottie, I've been accused of this crime. And I'm just wondering how that conversation went. Um, it was, well, I knew about the 98 incident, and the, welf the children welfare of Pennsylvania said there was no found, he was not found guilty. Mm -hmm. And um, that young man, his mother had said he would never have anything to do with Jerry. And the 1998 had, incidents, that's the shower incident right, at, at Penn State. Right. And he, for 13 years, he had a, a re, I mean, he came to our house, he came to football games, he, we went to dinner with him. Then um, it was, I think it was, it must have been in, I guess it started when, I, I can't even, I can't remember. Um, in, it was with the uh, accuser number one, Jerry was called, um, to go talk to the people in Lock Haven about that. Mm -hmm. And it started off, it was not what was said, that that, that uh, um, accusations just went further and further. Um, and we talked about it. And I said, oh, things will be okay. It will be okay. He said, well, the things he's saying are really bad, and it's going to be rough, I'm sure. And I said, no, I don't think it will be. And so that's what Jerry said. Jerry mm -hmm. said to you... Because he knew... He, I didn't know complete... Because no one could see what the allegations were at that time. And this was the later incident, not the incident in, right. in 1998. Right, This was the, the, uh, the accuser number one. So we're talking early 2000 mm -hmm. then. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because that's what I think, you know, when I look at this, you know, and, and I think about the situation, I, I think to myself... You know, what would someone say to someone else? And so that's what I'm trying to get a sense of, of, you know, what Jerry said to you. So his words were, these people are saying some very bad things. And I, you know, and he, I said, well, they, you know, it will be okay, I'm sure. Because, I mean, I know who Jerry is. And um, I, I, I knew those things would not be possible. I think context is so important in this case. The 1998 episode, which was found to be unfounded, was Jerry was accused of picking a boy up in a shower. That was it. Mm -hmm. There were no charges. It was fully investigated. Right. And then, and, and so people think that, oh my gosh, this was a, a huge warning sign that he's clearly a pedophile. Well, in retrospect, if you believe later that he's a pedophile, then you look at it and go, oh my gosh, there it was. But no, wait a minute. This, as Dottie says, the mother of this boy knew and and had, had acknowledged a 13-year un uneventful, no allegation relationship with Jerry after that episode. And then, so people say, understandably, well, what's he doing showering with a boy in 2001 when Mike McQuarry comes in and, and claims now, 10 years after the fact, that when he gets the date, the month, and the year of the event wrong, flat wrong. He claims now to have seen some sort of an assault. What people don't understand is, and I'm, I've said this to Jerry, and Jerry acknowledges this was not a smart move. But th people think, well, was let he me ask. Let me just let me just very quickly ask you about that because here, here's my thought, and and I think you 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 hit the nail on the head when it comes to something. 
when you look back at 1998, and you're right, there was no admission of any wrongdoing. Jerry was showering with the young boy in 1998. Mm -hmm. But at that point, um, would it have been smart to do it again? Well, and I have said that to Jerry as well. And I don't know if Dottie is, but I, I know that, that this is something that Jerry regrets. But people need to understand the context. It doesn't make it right, but here's makes the context. People need to understand the story of the boy in the Mike McQuarrie episode. He was a month short of his 14th birthday. He was two years short of being a varsity letterman on his high school football team. He was on the record on the day Joe Paterno was fired saying unequivocally, I'm the boy that was in the shower that night. Nothing happened that night. Nothing happened any other night. He has never wavered from that statement. His lawyers have never contradicted it. I am positive that there was no assault that night. Mm. And here's the most important thing, and Dottie will certainly verify this. That boy Jerry viewed as a son, not as some stranger off the street. This was somebody who a couple of years later, Jerry would stand in as his father at his senior high school football game, who would speak at his high school graduation. Jerry, Jerry and Dottie went to this boy and then man, a Marine's wedding. He drove over 10 and a half hours from his Marine barracks in North Carolina to attend the funeral of Jerry's mother. Okay. This was a son to Jerry. Point taken. But you understand, I saw you nodding. Um, as, you, as you look back, um, you know, you look back at what happened and you say to yourself, okay, 1998, this happened. Again, no admission of any wrongdoing, but told not a good idea to do, do it again. And then he does it again. But it, was like, it wasn't like he just took boys and took them to the shower. It was when he would work them out, and, and, and they would shower. And it's a public place. I mean, there's people that come and go in the locker room all the time. You never know when anyone is going to come in. It's not like he was hiding from anything. Do you, do you and, and, and I'm asking this because this is uh, when uh, people found out that I was coming to do this story, um, the one thing that I heard from people in this community um, repeatedly is, um, and these are people who support you, um, they say, you know, is there a possibility that, that Dottie Sandusky is delusional? She's just deluding herself or has buried things just so deeply she's just unwilling to accept the truth. I, I'm not that kind of a person, and I believe he's innocent. And if I didn't believe he was innocent, I would not stand by him. I, I think I know that the man, I mean, I've been with him for, like I said, for 30, I've known him for 38 years. We were together for 37 years. And I just, you know, I know who I am and what I am. When I got involved in this case, I presumed exactly that. I'm sorry to tell you, I mean, I've told Dottie this, I presumed she was delusional. I mean, she didn't seem stupid, so she had to be an ostrich of an epic proportion or delusional. After getting to know her extremely well over the last year or so, she is not delusional. I'll give you a perfect example. Just yesterday, we spent, what, 40 minutes on the phone with one of the writers of the Paterno Report, an expert in pedophilia, where Dottie is asking this, this expert questions trying to get him to prove, basically, to her that somehow Jerry was a pedophile. He wasn't able to do it, and she had zero concern that he would because she knew that Jerry is innocent, but... But would, if she was a delusional ostrich, would she be spending time on the phone let, allowing an expert in pedophilia the opportunity to try to prove to her that her husband is guilty? She has zero fear of that. She, she's not putting hands over her eyes or ears. She, and, and she knows the case better than the vast majority of news media members, I can assure you that. She knows the case. She's read the transcripts. She knows the accusers personally. This is not a delusional person. Um, do you, is, is it your belief that all of these young men are, are making this up, making up these, these allegations for money? I don't believe their stories, and I think, I think that could be a big, a big incentive. Why would they all, why do you think so many would say the same thing about Jerry Sandusky? I think that they could have been manipulated by people. I think a lot of them had uh, financial problems. Um, I, I just, I don't believe their stories. I'm sorry. I think, again, the evolution of this case is incredibly important. You said 
they're all saying the same thing. That's not actually true. Well, I mean, I'm, 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 well, what I'm basically saying is that they're all saying the same thing and that they're all saying in one way or another that Jerry Sandusky oh, I'm not criticizing assaulted. the question, but, okay. it's a, but it is a perception that's out there that somehow there's credibility that so many people are saying the same thing. Okay. But what if all those people have a huge financial incentive and what if all those people are told by somebody they trust an investigator, a police officer, a prosecutor, that we have a boy, victim number one, Aaron Fisher, who has been claiming that Jerry has been forcing him into sex acts for years. And we have a second pillar of this case named Mike McQueary, although they probably didn't use his name, a football coach who saw Jerry assaulting a boy in the shower. Now, if Jerry, if you had a long relationship with Jerry, he's touchy-feely, he likes to grab you around the neck, he, he is clearly a guy who does not fear physical boundaries. There's no question. He would be the first to acknowledge that he, that he has a different set of physical boundaries than most people. There are people like that. That doesn't make them pedophiles. So if, you're, if that's the person that you know and you're told these things, is that not going to change your perception? Will you not all of a sudden go, well, wait a minute. I'm being told that I was groomed. He never did anything I, that I know was directly sexual, but was I being groomed? Did I misinterpret something? I use the analogy of the Loch Ness Monster. You know, no one believed that there was a Loch Ness Monster until all of a sudden all other people, including the, this media myth, got created. There was a Loch Ness Monster. All of a sudden, ripples in the water and shadows and eels sticking their heads out of the water is all of a sudden, that's the Loch Ness Monster. No, it's not. You've been, you've been, that's been suggested to you. That's created a perception for you. And when you create a money incentive... And lawyers who knew full well the day that Joe Paterno was fired that this was going to be basically Fort Knox opening up with the keys on the table, then look out. I, I'm actually amazed there weren't more accusers coming forward after Joe well, Paterno's fired. Well, we should say for the record, you know, the attorneys who represent those young men would strongly, strongly de uh, deny they, that. They would but deny just, what? Well, since they're not here. The, wait a minute. Whoa, 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 whoa. Since wait. they're not here. Well, well, let, if you're gonna, that. That's fine. But, but you also have to acknowledge the people who made the most money out of all this were the trial lawyers. I mean, there's a lawyer here in State College named Andrew Shubin who represented nine of these victims, including the Mike McQuarrie victim, after he had made the statement saying nothing ever happened, mm -hmm. and Matt Sandusky. And, and, and by the way, that, that particular attorney, the, the mother of the McQuarrie victim, used to work for him, and he represented him in a DUI before this case ever happened. Okay, I mean, now you're heading into a whole different... But well, I'm sorry, we're getting into facts. No, 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 no. Can I say one thing? You absolutely... This is about you. Okay. You, um, you know, you were talking about the kids and what they were told, and you were at trial. So you know they had a tape of a lawyer and of a... Um, I guess he was a... I don't know whether he's an attorney general officer or a mm -hmm. state policeman or what. They were interviewing one of the um, I remember accusers, this. and he needed to go out and have a cigarette. And, and the, conversation, and the was conversation was recorded, and they were telling each other, can't we do more to tell him to say that he had had sex with Jerry? Can we, improve, can we, can we not tell him something else? And I, th I wasn't at trial, so I don't know, so I just got it from our family. But that they said, oh, we do that, you know, we can do that. We can tell them that there's other victims. You and I, when we were at uh, the prison, minute, we talked on, about... Hold on, hold on a second. That's an incredibly important point. If that yes. happened in the Michael Jackson case, if there was a tape recorded by accident of, of a victim's lawyer saying to investigators, hey, can we lie to him and tell him we have other people who had sex with Jerry Sandusky to get him to say he had sex, and then all of a sudden he says he has sex and he's only one of two victims who said there were sex acts at the time of the arrest, the Michael Jackson case shuts down. Goodbye. I have a nice say, day. We, re we reported that. Oh, mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, oh come, Jason. That's ridic we ridiculous. We reported that. It's not ridiculous. If, if that would have been a bombshell. Bombshell. I was there every day. You I reported know, it. I know. You um, wait, 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 there's a um, difference between reporting and, rep and giving it the, the magnitude that it deserved. That deserved huge magnitude and would have gotten it if it was in the Michael Jackson case. Okay, we're not going to talk about Michael Jackson. Okay. And I don't think we should bring Michael Jackson into this. Um, this is not the Michael Jackson case. But when we were at prison, um, I remember something that you had brought up, which was very telling to me. Um, you referenced victim number nine, and you became very angry because that was the one, I believe, who had said um, when he was in the basement, he called out for help, and you should have heard. You said, I was here. 
And if someone hit you, I would have said something. I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. He said he screamed. He That's said he screamed. He also said we didn't feed him. If we did, we brought his food down to the basement, mm -hmm. which is untrue. Um, and I mean, I can take you down to the basement. If anybody screams in the basement, I would hear it. Even if I'm up on the second floor, I could hear it. And I never heard any screams. He also said that one night he called his mother to come get him in the middle of the night. And every time he was at our house, he was always here in the morning when we got up. So that was not true either. And he also said that he and Jerry had lunch with Jerry um, at, I think he said, at Beaver Stadium during recruiting. I mean, there is no way. Jerry only had lunch with Joe when he was recruiting, and he would not take a, a second mile young man with him to dinner, and Joe would not do that. Does that make you angry? Does yes, that... it makes me angry. I mean, that people are not telling the truth. That That's what makes me angry. Mm -hmm. And that an innocent man is in prison. Um, is it, and I, and I imagine, I already know the answer to this, but it seems like I can read the pain that, it, that when you were there seeing uh, your husband there in prison, what that was like for you. Mm -hmm. How has that, that been? It's, it's, I try to keep it good. Um, it's sad. He's in his cell 23 hours a day, Monday through Friday, and then on weekends it's 24 hours. Um, he can once a week go to law library. They're in cages, and they're ne he's next to another man, um, and he's able to look uh, cases up on the internet. Or, I don't think it's the internet, but on a computer some way. It's it's hard. We talk about family things. We talk about the case. We talk about our friends. We talk about what he's doing in prison. What has happened, you know, um, and I just I I try to cheer him up, but usually he cheers me up instead of me cheering him up. I want to read something to you that uh, something that Jerry wrote me. Uh, this is from February third. Uh, it's a letter from Jerry, and it's about Matt. It's about your son Matt, and I had written to Jerry and I had asked him. Um, because I had heard about this documentary, as you know, as you both know, uh, that premiered at Sundance, um, featuring Matt. So I asked him how he was doing. And uh, he said, this is what he wrote, I've been consumed with how or if to respond to Matt. I wrote, I rewrote, and rewrote. It ended with four pages of writing that just sit. It's very confusing. Um, and I'm wondering... Is that the same for you? Is it confusing for you? Have you had any contact with Matt? I, I'm not allowed to have any contact with Matt. Um, you need to know that we've known Matt since he was eight. He came to live with us when he was 16 because he'd been in some trouble and he was going to be sent to a detention center. And the judge let us take him as a foster child. He, we adopted him when he was 18. Matt is a, a very likable, very believable person. Uh, we've had to, we've had many things that have gone on with Matt. He has stolen from our family. He's stolen from our kids. He stole from my mother-in-law. And we recently found out right after the trial that Jerry's championship rings were missing. And one was on eBay. And we told the police and they investigated it. And they found the man that had bought the ring. It had been 10 years. Jerry does, can't wear his rings because of his fingers. And um, that, that he had sold it at a... a flea market. We didn't know it because Jerry never checked his rings and the police have investigated it and, and they are looking into it. Um, he's just, he, when Jerry was under house arrest, Matt had gone through a divorce and his wife said there was no way that their three kids were going to come over to see us. We saw their kids quite a bit at the time. Um, we helped Matt a lot. He lived with us for almost a year when he went through his divorce in the basement and his kids would come stay quite a few times. Matt went to court and fought to have the kids to be able to come over and see Jerry while he was under house arrest. What happened, do you think? I have, I, I don't know whether someone talked to him, or whether he saw money, whether he, I, I you would have to ask Matt. I, I don't know. I, I don't know. The, all the other kids do not believe him. Um, you know, he he always liked a better deal. He always liked to be, you know, better. And he did have some financial problems. As, as, as a mother, though, that's, that's got to be painful. That's got to hurt. It hurts. It hurts. But 
he has to live with his life. Have you um, have you had uh, after it after you learned that Matt was making these allegations? Were you able to have any conversation with him? Did he explain anything at all to you no. or to anyone else in the family? No. Supposedly, he talked to one of the kids and tried to convince them to to change their tune. And he said there, and they said there's no way, because he, Dad never did anything to us. There are a couple of things we need to understand about Matt Sandusky, which have not been reported properly. He testified in this case. He testified in the grand jury, and he said Jerry Sandusky never abused me, and he said there was reason to not believe the other accusers. He was Jerry Sandusky's biggest supporter. Up until the middle of the trial, after attending the first day of the trial with Dottie, he comes back and he tells family members in just the other room that he could get up on the stand and lie just like the, the victim who did that day. But the question it's, is, why, did he, why, did, why the change of heart? Why? It was very clear. It's very clear what happened with Matt Sandusky. He saw the handwriting on the wall. He wanted to be on the winning team. He saw the money. He got paid. Matt Sandusky has been paid millions of dollars by Penn State for an allegation that makes no sense, that is contradicted by his own actions, including having a fight in court during the court case to have his own children be able to see Jerry Sandusky. He claims that in the middle of the trial, through repressed memory therapy, a debunked form of science that no expert believes in, that he suddenly remembers this rather mild form of abuse occurring well before all of this happened, well before he asks Dottie and Jerry to adopt him. And by the way, I know the details, media is not big into the details, but in his story he claims that he, that Jerry transitioned in abusing him to abusing victim number four. There's a problem. There's four years from the time that Matt Sandusky turns 15 when he says the abuse ends and the time when Jerry Sandusky meets victim four. I realize that the facts are inconvenient here. Matt Sandusky's lying. And Matt Sandusky suddenly decides that because he's going to be a star in a documentary film, that the name that he had disowned, Sandusky, he's suddenly going to use again, because I guess that's good. It's a, it's a stage name now for him, because it works well in headlines to promote a documentary that's an absolute joke. Matt Sandusky is by far, by far the least credible of any of the accusers. He never testified that he was abused, only testified that he did. At best, by his own admission, he's an admitted perjurer who was cowardly and didn't come forward soon enough, which I don't believe, but by his own admission, if he had come forward when he was abused, none of this would have happened. He's actually more to blame than anybody if he's telling the truth, which he's not. I'm wondering, at a certain point, uh, would you want to reconcile with Matt? I would like to talk to Matt. I really miss seeing his kids. They were part of our lives. Um, and I, the hurt that they must be going through because they thought so much of myself and Jerry. Um, you know, one's 11, one's 10, and one's seven. And that's tough ages. And they've gone through, their mom and dad were divorced, and both of their parents have remarried. Um, I, I, I would love to talk to Matt just to see, you know, why and what, is, what his thoughts are. Um. When, John, when you and I were talking, um, uh, you had said, I'm, I'm used to tumbling or, you know, with people on set and things like that and, and taking this aggressive point of view. Um, I, I told Dottie there were some things I had heard about. This is what people say about you, John. Um, your, your critics. Your critics say, they call you a crackpot, a publicity seeker, mm -hmm. a man who is out to advance his own agenda even at the expense of the Sanduskies. Who said that? Well, I could, you, I could, there's a couple. Actually. Well, you're, so you're going to give me unattributed quotes to respond to. Okay, I'll, well, I'll be happy. But I'm just saying, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, these are your critics. Some of okay. them are attorneys. Yeah. I can tell you that. Well, attorneys for whom? Representing, well, well uh, Michael yeah, Jackson. No, yeah. they're attorneys <laughs> representing, you know. The victims, attorneys. really. The so the, so, the, so let, me, let me just make this clear. So what you're telling me is that the people who made millions of dollars in this case are criticizing the guy who has not made a dime from this case and has probably destroyed his career forever by pursuing the truth. That's, let's just make that clear. I'm not, the, people will do whatever they can to destroy me because they can't destroy me on the facts. All I ask is, take me on on the facts. And, and if there was somebody else 
who was a was a celebrity because I I know that CNN especially if I was Roseanne Barr uh, like like you guys gave her the credibility on the Steubenville case which she knew nothing about uh, if I was a celebrity then maybe I would take be taken more seriously I know I'm not a celebrity and I'm not making money from this I just have the facts and the guts and the courage to stand up for what I know the truth to be and I'm sorry that the truth doesn't matter to anybody anymore but if anybody thinks that this is a good career move for me um, I'm a lot of things but an imbecile is not one of them. And I would have to be an imbecile to think this was a good career move. I'm doing this because it's the truth and no one else is standing up for it. I wish somebody else was. Please, if somebody else wants to take this cause on, I'm happy to let them do it. If, especially, Roseanne, please, any, any celebrity, please go ahead and do this. Because no, no celebrity is going to have the guts to do it because the rest of the media will destroy them as those quotes just try to prove. Well, I, you know, I guess my question is, when, when do, are you, Dottie, um, because I know that you know you, you you look for people who are supportive, but do you are you ever concerned, especially if you want to try to reconcile with Matt? Are you concerned that aligning yourself with with John here might eventually put that in in jeopardy? No, because John is he has the facts, and other people are not looking at the facts. I mean, like I said, you were at trial, you know, and I I found it very interesting. Uh, one of the our kids said to me, he said, Mom, you know people are saying you're getting big bucks for these interviews, and I'm not getting a penny for the interviews. I just want people to know that. It's just that I want to prove I know that Jerry is innocent, and he does not believe, need to be where he is. How, how deep is that belief? Very deep, very deep. I, I believe in God, and I believe God has a purpose, and some purpose will come out of this. Um, that that he will see us through he has I mean I've been able to I didn't know how I was going to be able to survive because when Jerry went to prison you lose, you lose um I don't have to live an expensive life I can live I mean we never did anything really outlandish I mean our vacations were on bowl games or when Jerry spoke at something we would take the kids and go because we had six kids and you know it was hard to do that with family um, and I he lost his social security and I thought I, I was thinking okay that's okay I will probably get like half of his social security because like if he had passed away and I have social security but I never were I did not work very much because of the kids I was a stay-at-home mom and um, then then they took his pension away which we are fighting for which is ridiculous because we could have taken that money and put it in other investments if we had known this was coming down the road and we would have it but I we're lucky and our house is paid for the car is paid for now our car has quite a few miles on it with me traveling every week um, but God will supply he will supply and in some way we will get through this I'm wondering at any point because um, it seems like your relationship is with you and your family is so close. At any point, was was there a family discussion where Jerry came to you all and said, "I did not do this. I did not do these things that I am being accused of." Yes, our son Jeff is sitting here with me, and he did. Uh, we kept it from the kids as long as we could because we did not know what was going to happen, and like you know, it was a three-year period kind of thing. And that was really hard. We had to tell the kids. And the kids questioned their dad. And he talked to them and he told them. And they believed their dad. They know he's innocent because they know who he is. And I'm sure it started with you, that conversation. And I'm wondering how difficult that was for you to hear that. And, and I'm wondering, at any point, um, did you have any doubt at all? Did you say to yourself, I've known this man you know, practically my whole life. But is there a chance? I don't know, because I know who he is. I know who he is. And I, I know that he is not guilty. You know, I know that uh, we had been talking about the appeal. And that is something that is still ongoing. Um, something could happen at any moment. Um, but... You know, there is a possibility that the, a strong possibility, let's be honest, that the appeal will not go in your favor. Mm -hmm. What do you do then? We can go to, I forget what it's called, it's, it's abbreviation. There is another appeal that we can go to after that. And will you? Sure. We will keep fighting. 
How long? How long do you? As need? long as we need to. And um, you know, our, our our family is very supportive. The kids go to see their dad. Uh, grandchildren have gone to see their dad or their grandfather. Friends, there's um. Last when Jerry was first put in prison, um, they I had to tell them the day I was going to go to prison. And with the weather the way it is in State College, you never know. And I have to go. There's some mountains I need to go over, and I'm not a snow driver. So there was one or two days that I did not make it, and so I couldn't see him that week. Um, and there's a young man who was in the second mile. He's married and has two kids, and he is very supportive of Jerry. And he um, he went, you know, he was able to go see Jerry. That people don't know the amount of people, like second mile young people, girls and boys, that are supportive of Jerry. But they, now four of them testified at trial. But they have not, they cannot speak out because they have been, a, uh, they have been criticized. And one of the young men who spoke at trial, he was really, people were really after him afterwards. I think you know who I mean. Yes. Dottie just makes a very good point there. You know, you called me a crackpot a moment ago. I did not call oh, okay. <laughs> you. See, you referenced me being called a crackpot. Okay. And I'll, I'll fully acknowledge that people think that. And they will think more of that. More people will think that after they see these series of interviews. I get that. The reality is, I have only found one person who is close to this case. People who lived it, were part of it. People primary people in this case and people who are on the periphery of it. One person, Scott Paterno, in this entire case that doesn't believe that what I'm saying is not only possibly true, that believes, many of them believe it's probably true. But this is so toxic to talk about in public because you're immediately called a crackpot if you question this narrative that was set in stone that Jerry Sandusky is not just a pedophile, but he's the worst pedophile monster that, that Pennsylvania has ever seen. The reality is, a lot more people agree with me than will ever be stupid enough to admit it publicly. The amount of cowardice on this story is astonishing. From moment from A to Z, cowardice has reigned in this story. And I, you know, I'm I'm not a coward. I'm a lot of things. I'm not a coward. And and the reality is, a lot more people agree with me than would ever admit it publicly. Yeah, but what's your but what's your motivation? <laughs> this is a. I find this amazing that we now live in a world where somebody who sees don't take it. What, hold on first. Hold on first. Don't take it as a negative. I'm just saying some people's motivation might come from their heart. I'm just right. simply trying to find out why. And I'm happy to answer this. Go ahead. Happy to answer this. I find it amazing that that we now live in a society where when somebody sees an injustice that they have a unique perspective on it and have access to information that most people don't have and wants to set about correcting that injustice with no financial motive, in fact, a negative financial motive, putting them, themselves and their careers in jeopardy, and that they do what they think they need to, that has to be done to try to correct that injustice, that they're automatically presumed to, to have some sort of a, a negative or a nefarious motivation. My motivation here is the truth. Joe Paterno, just before he died, said, I want to know what the truth of this matter is. I think he felt as if he didn't know what the truth was when he died. I think he had suspicions that the story that was being told wasn't true. Well, guess what? Joe Paterno was right. And Joe Paterno was railroaded. Jerry Sandusky was railroaded as well. There was a symbiotic relationship in that railroading. People need to know that because way too much damage was done here that was not based in the facts and was not just, and that's what I'm standing up for. I hear you. I mean, I hear what your point of view is, but you understand what... What I'm saying, and the, again, this comes from even people who I think uh, are sympathetic to Dottie Sandusky, which is their their feeling is that uh, you're you are a credibility issue, and that you might end up harming the Sandusky think, family. Uh, how can he harm us anymore? I mean, I don't think he's <laughs> harming us, but we've been harmed lots. And there's you know, people just need to know what the truth is, and that Jerry is innocent. And that the trial was not fair. He only had seven months to prepare. Um, Attorney Kane has an investigation going on because she wants to know why it took the grand jury so long to make a decision to go forward. And it has taken them over a year. And they still do not because of the mass amount of paperwork that they have to go through. 
And Joe, every day we were going to trial, Joe was getting new stuff and new stuff from the Attorney General's office. I mean, literally reading stuff on the way to trial. Um, I, I wish Jerry could uh, be here so we could, you know, ask him uh, questions as well. But again, I, I, you know, I do have the letter here. Um, if you had to look forward, do you think at any point um, you will be able to have, and I know I sort of went over this once before, but I just want to make sure we're clear. At any point, do you think you'll be able to reconcile? It could be you. It could be you. But do you think anyone from you or your family will be able to reconcile with Matt Sandusky, your son? That's hard to say. We've been, people do not know what we've been through with Matt. I mean, a month before, about a month, I guess, before trial, we ended up having to get him out of jail because he didn't pay his child support. He and his, his boss and, and we paid the bail for him to get out. Um, you know, we've had police come to our house in the middle of the night because his ex-wife filed a PFA on him. Um, we tried. We gave him chances, you know. And, and yes, as a Christian, I would give people a chance again. And hope, I hope, you know, I hope he's learned and I hope he is, he is a great father. He is a great father to his children. And I hope that he will do something special with his life. Um, and for those who, who say when they think of Dottie Sandusky as uh, this pillar of strength, um, obviously I, I can see cracks in, in, in that pillar. But um, where does that come from? From God, from my family, our family, um, our friends. Our church family has been really special. And um, our close friends. I just had an email last night from a friend's son who grew up with our kids and grew up with Jerry and thought the world of Jerry. And he said, I just want to tell you how much we're praying for you. And I, he, he is now in, a, in an administration in school in athletics. And he said, I just want Jerry to know how happy I am being in the position I'm in and let him know how much I care about him. And I just, I appreciate everybody that has been supportive of, supportive of, of us. And those who haven't, um, I, I'm sorry, you know, I, I, we're who we are, and I try to tell the truth. 